Okay, so for our class here today, we're going to look, first of all, at other systems in simple harmonic motion. <clears throat> Anytime you have a restoring force, that's a force directed back towards an equilibrium point that varies directly with the extension, you're going to have simple harmonic motion. So the example we looked at was the elastic force, where the force was kx directed back towards equilibrium. So here's the distance from equilibrium, <clears throat> and the force is directly proportional to it. <clears throat> the coefficient of proportionality <clears throat> for the spring was k, <coughs> and that k constant divided by the mass square root it gives you the frequency of small vibrations, or the frequency of the simple harmonic motion. Now, <clears throat> let's consider a few problems where we do find simple harmonic motion. For instance, the simple pendulum. The forces that act on it include the tension from the cord and then the weight. Weight gets resolved into two components. There's an mg cosine theta component and there's an mg sine theta component. Now previously we had written out these force equations in the NTB coordinate system. Um, this time we're going to use the cylindrical coordinate system, so I'll put uh, an origin, say, here, and then the angle theta, well, the, the point R will be measured from here, and the angle theta will be measured from, I guess, from the positive x-axis, so it's swinging around like that. So it's swinging back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Let's actually make this, delete that, um, delete those, Let's make let's make this the zero of theta. So this is like the positive x-axis here. Let's try to draw it straight. <clears throat> and this is, I guess, the corresponding y-axis. And so theta is measured just in here like this. And r is measured from the origin to where the pendulum bob is. Now, because that's just the length of the cord, that's a constant. <clears throat> So in cylindrical coordinates, you recall the expression we had for the acceleration. This was the radial term, and this is the angular term. Because r is a constant, this term disappears. And you just get um, here, it's going to be, let me see if I can fit this in there. It's going to be, for the radial acceleration, it's going to be negative l theta dot squared, where l is the same as the radius. <clears throat> and then for the theta acceleration, and you can fill this in here, um, r dot's going to be zero because the radius is the length is a constant, and so we're just going to have l theta double dot. So let's now write force equations. The sum of the radial forces, and I'll do it over here, well, the radial direction is outwards away from the origin, so mg cos theta is in the positive radial direction. And tensions in the negative radial direction, that's got to equal the mass times the radial acceleration, which we saw here is minus L theta dot squared. Now the sum of the theta forces, well there's only one, I guess we've got mg sine theta, which is actually in the negative theta hat direction, right, because theta would be increasing this way, that would be theta hat, and mg sine theta is in the opposite direction. So that's got to equal the mass times the um, theta acceleration, which is L theta double dot in the theta hat direction. So if we simplify that equation then, let's return over here now. If we simplify that equation, uh, we get uh, ML theta double dot is minus mg sine theta. <clears throat> now this is not quite simple harmonic motion. Remember for the simple harmonic motion we want uh, a force <clears throat> ma that varies directly with an extent uh, distance from equilibrium. Well the distance from equilibrium, the displacement from equilibrium is related to the angle. So we've got theta double dot being proportional to theta sine theta instead of theta. It's not quite simple harmonic motion. 
Well, <clears throat> for small angles, though, sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Here's the full Taylor uh, series. And if the angle is really, really small, then the terms in theta cubed and theta fifth and theta seventh will be extremely small, and they could be dropped to first order. So sine of an angle is really close to an angle. <clears throat> in radians for small angles. You can try it actually. If you do the sine of like 0.1 radians, you'll see the answer is extremely close to 0.1. So we can replace for small angles sine theta just with theta. If you do that, okay, this thing here is approximately theta, then you get this equation here. ML theta double dot is minus mg theta. Canceling off the m, dividing both sides by L, you get theta double dot is minus g over l theta. This is now harmonic motion. Okay, <clears throat> It's analogous up here to the force equation we had. Because if f is minus kx, that means a mass times acceleration, mx double dot is minus kx. That means x double dot is minus k over mx. So we were searching for a function who, when you did its second derivative, you got the function itself times a constant. Well, that's exactly the differential equation that we have now for our simple pendulum in the small angle approximation. So we know that the theta function uh, that satisfies this is going to be sines and cosines. Now, the omega constant, remember, is going to be the square root of this expression here, of g over l. For the spring, it was k over m. For the pendulum, it's going to be g over l. So the g is obviously a constant, on the Earth anyway. And what this tells us is that a longer pendulum has a lower rate of vibration. That makes sense. The longer pendulum cord will swing back and forth more slowly, have a slower rate of vibration and a longer period of t. Of course, as we saw already, we can write it as a sum of sine and cosine. We can write it in the form a cos omega t plus delta, or we can use our complex exponentials there. <clears throat> okay, but the key thing in terms of solving the differential equation is that this term here we identify it as omega not squared. Alright, so here's another example for you to do some force analysis. <clears throat> Show that the force ends up being directly proportional to the distance from equilibrium x and then find the frequency omega of the simple harmonic motion. Now, <clears throat> a technique, a mathematical technique that's really uh, useful for us in physics is um, a small x assumption, a small x analysis. Frequently, we'll do that with either Taylor series or the binomial theorem. Now, the binomial theorem states that <clears throat> um, if you're expanding 1 plus x to the n, the first term will be 1 to the n. The second term is always going to be um, the exponent n multiplied by x. If you remember your binomial theorem in mathematics, uh, this is n choose 0, n choose 0, 1 to the n, x to the 0. That's the first term. This second term here is going to be n choose 1, then it's going to be 1 to the n minus 1, x to the 1. Now, <clears throat> 1 to the n minus 1 is still 1, there's the x to the 1 term, and n choose 1, if you use your combinatorics, works out to be the exponent n. Now, why that's useful is because if x is really small, then all the terms that are higher powers of x we can drop, and basically this bracket will be approximately equal to 1 plus nx. The way we use that is if we have something like 1 plus x all squared, okay, then we know that when we expand that, <clears throat> it's going to be 1 plus 2x plus x squared, if you were to do the full expansion. And if x is really, really, really small, then the term in x squared can be ignored, and it's basically equal to 1 plus 2x. Okay. <clears throat> now, how about this one? 1 over 1 minus 4x. Well, let's write that, and again, I'll do it over here for clarity. Let's write that as 1 minus 4x to the minus 1 power. <clears throat> now, that if we do the binomial expansion, the binomial expansion works 
on negative and fractional exponents as well, it just ends up being an infinite expansion. Okay. <clears throat> so the first term is just going to be 1. Uh, the second term is going to be, uh, uh, there's going to be a 1, there's going to be a minus 4x, and then it's going to be multiplied by this exponent, minus 1. And if x is really small, then we'll be able to drop the higher powers of x, because the next term will involve x squared, and this is going to be approximately equal to 1 plus 4x squared. Now there is another way to do that. If you remember um, the formula for a geometric series, so the sum of a r to the n minus 1 from 1 to infinity, it's 1, sorry, it's a over 1 minus r. So this is kind of like a common ratio of 4x. So we are summing 4x to the n from, uh, let's see, sorry, 4x to the n minus 1 from 1 up to infinity. <clears throat> and so you could see there when you put in 1, it's 4x to the 0. That's the first power. Then you put in n equals 2, and it is going to be, um, so I had to pause to see my mistake. Here is my mistake right here. Uh, the minus 1 times minus 4x, it, it should just be 1 plus 4x. Okay, so the second term there, this is approximately equal to 1 minus 4x to the minus 1, which is 1 plus 4x. <clears throat> Now, of course, that's exactly what I was finding here, right? Because this geometric series, if you put in n equals 1, you just get 1. If you put in n equals 2, you, you get 4x. Now that I've resolved the differences between those two, let's just look at what the next term would be. Putting in n equals 3, you would get 16x squared. And again, if x is really small, then you can drop the 16x squared and just get 1 plus 4x out of it. All right, let's try a slightly harder one here. We've got 1 over the root of a squared minus x squared. We're going to have to do a little bit of algebra with that first. <clears throat> um, let's work in the small x assumption again. In order to work with the binomial theorem, the leading term needs to be 1. So we're going to factor an a squared out inside the square root, which means pulling an a outside of the square root. That will make the leading term 1, and what you'll be left with here is x over a all squared. So we still leave the 1 over a there, but then it's 1 minus this x over a all squared to the negative 1 half power. <clears throat> now, if x is really, really small, then according to the binomial theorem, this will be approximately equal to you'll have 1, then you're going to have this, whatever is here, that's x over a squared, multiplied by the exponent, negative a half. So that is 1 over a times 1, and then this simplifies to 1 half x over a all squared, and I suppose you could expand that, it doesn't really help very much but you get x squared over 2a cubed, okay? So we had to do a little algebra there before we could use that small angle assumption. Uh, yes, okay, fair enough. <clears throat> now, where are we going to use that? Well, let's use that in this potential well. So here we've got um, an upside down Mexican hat function. And so it's going to be centered on the origin here, and it just goes like that on the negative side, and then pretty much like, the, sorry, on the positive side, and pretty much the mirror image over here on the negative side. Well, I didn't draw it like a mirror image, but I should have, because it's an even function. So there you go. That's probably the worst graph in the history of mankind, but there it is. <clears throat> Let me do it over here. Just so much easier. So there are the axes, and there's our potential, well, just like that. Okay, so there's a few things we want to find. First, we want to find the force function. 
Well, we know the force is the negative derivative of the potential energy function. So I've got to do the negative derivative of 1 over x squared plus a squared. So that's going to equal, well, the, the bottom squared. So that's x squared plus a squared squared. And then it's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is nothing. And then it's going to be minus the top, which is 1, times the derivative of the bottom, which is 2x. So what you find then is it's 2x over x squared plus a squared all squared. Oh my goodness. All right, so that's the force function. <clears throat> now, um, we can see that um, the force is 0. That's the equilibrium point at uh, both x equals 0 and also x is plus or minus infinity. At x equals 0, we could see from the graph that the equilibrium will be stable because um, if you're displaced a little bit in this direction, there's going to be a restoring force that brings you back to equilibrium. Okay? If you're displaced on this side, again, there's a restoring force that brings you back towards equilibrium. <clears throat> now, um, do, 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 um, where was I? Okay, so um, yes, I've been able to fix this now. Uh, the problem was I the function itself has got an extra minus sign in it. Right, the potential function's got that minus sign in front. So I pick up a third minus sign, um, which is important because I want the force function to be negative so it's opposite to the sense of x. Okay? That's what um, establishes, in terms of the equation, that there's a stable equilibrium at x. So if x is positive, the force is negative. That means it's back towards equilibrium. That means we have a stable equilibrium. Now, let's let x be really small, okay? Because this does not look like Hooke's law. It does not look like f equals kx. But let's try and see what happens for a very small x. So for a very small x, the force will be minus 2 epsilon over a squared plus epsilon squared all squared. Now, let's set this up for a small epsilon approximation. This is going to be, well, we're going to pull the a squared out. It'll end up being a to the fourth. And then it's going to be 1 plus epsilon over a squared squared. Now, I still need to do some work on that. Um, so let's work with that. Minus 2 epsilon. We've got a to the fourth here. And then this is going to be 1 plus epsilon over a all squared to the minus 2 power. Now, using the binomial theorem, that's going to be 1 minus 2 epsilon over a squared. That'll be the leading term, plus stuff that gets small. And then this is going to be minus 2 epsilon over a to the fourth. So when you expand that, it's minus 2 over a to the fourth epsilon. And then it's going to be plus 4 over a to the sixth epsilon cubed, etc. Okay. Now we see that to leading order, right? If epsilon is small, we can ignore this. To leading order, the force then is minus 2 over a to the power of 4 times epsilon. So for small vibrations, we've got Hooke's law. Force is minus kx. So the effective k constant here, so we'll do like k in quotes, is 2 over the value of a to the fourth power. And the frequency of what are called small vibrations This is like the equivalent omega. That's the root of the equivalent k over m. So in this case, it's the root of 2 over a to the power of 4 times the mass of the oscillator, which isn't given. 
Now we call this the frequency because it's omega, that's a circular frequency. We say small vibrations because we made a small x an assumption in order to come up with this approximately linear storing force. So this is a common task and <clears throat> this is another common system, another place where we use simple harmonic motion assumptions. Uh, for these potential wells, okay? Because most potential wells, when you get in really, really close here, you do have linear, right? The first term is linear. It's pretty close to being a straight line when you're in there really close. All right, and um, you can look back at the Morse potential because we already did a Taylor expansion close to the equilibrium point and got that it was proportional to the distance. So you can go back and do this last line for the Morse potential. And then <clears throat> the next task here you're going to um, try to solve the simple pendulum, but not make the small angle assumption. Instead, you're going to use the actual angular acceleration and solve the equation numerically and see what graph you get. Then compare that with the ideal one and um, see uh, how large the difference is. So you'll do that in Python. The instructions are here. This will kind of be the first time that I'm giving you a Python assignment to try on your own. And um, I expect that some of you will be able to get all of it. It may be still difficult for those of you not familiar with programming. So um, don't be alarmed if you can't get it. I just want to see what you can do on your own at this stage. So that concludes our class. And you can work on that assignment. And we will see you next week.